In this lecture video, we're going to talk about the acid-base chemistry of salts. And towards the very end, we're going to spend some time talking about water as a solvent for most of the acid-base chemistry that we've learned. So I'll start with some definitions. A salt is any ionic compound that has two parts that are oppositely charged. The positively charged part, or ion, is the cation, and the negatively charged ion is the anion. A spectator ion is an ion that appears as a reactant and as a product in the reaction equation. And because it appears on both sides, it's unchanged during the reaction. And normally it's there to help balance a charge of other ions that might be undergoing the reaction. So unchanged, another word for that in chemistry is unreactive. And if you're looking for more words, um, then you can look at this uh, pigeon here, um, inert, inactive, etc. As a quick preview of today's lecture, I have these two groups of ions. And in each of these groups, one member doesn't belong. So here on the left, I have these simple ions that are consisting of a single atom or the monatomic ions. And on the right, I have polyatomic ions of various charges. So to kind of give a hint, most of these can be classified on the left as spectator ions. And the ones on the right mostly fall into the category of being non-spectator ions, meaning that they are reactive in performing acid-base chemistry. So hopefully you would have singled out fluoride. Fluoride is the conjugate base of the weak acid HF, and it is itself a weak base that can perform acid-base chemistry in water. On the right, the member that doesn't fit is perchlorate, ClO4-. This is the counter anion of the strong acid, perchloric acid, HClO4, and it is unreactive by itself in water. We've seen spectator ions before when we showed the dissociation of a strong acid like HCl in water. So HCl reacts completely to form hydronium ion and chloride anion. And likewise, the dissociation of a strong base, like magnesium hydroxide, which reacts completely to release hydroxide and this magnesium dication. So because these arrows go all the way to the right, that means these are not equilibrium reactions, and there is no movement of the reaction in the backwards direction. And so if we begin on the product side with chloride, we cannot actually traverse back to HCl. And that is true for the base reaction. If we begin here on the right with magnesium dication and hydroxide, we cannot reform magnesium hydroxide. The inability of these ions to move backwards means that they are basically unable to do acid-base chemistry, and therefore they are spectator ions. So how do we recognize spectator ions? One, by definition, they are unreactive, and in the context here, they do not react with water to undergo any proton transfer or acid-base chemistry. And because they don't engage in acid-base chemistry, they do not change the pH of water on their own. And typically, they're recognized because these are the ions associated either with strong acids, such as chloride, bromide, iodide, or these polyatomic ions like nitrate and perchlorate. Also, the ions associated with strong bases like magnesium 2 plus, a group 2 metal, or other group 1 metal cations. So let's talk about the ions that are reactive in water and can undergo acid-base chemistry. And by doing so, they will change the pH of the water solution. 
The first of these categories are the A minus anions, and these represent the conjugate bases of weak acids HA. So we learned before that if we start with a conjugate base in water, it can undergo a KB reaction to form hydroxide and some of its conjugate acid. So examples of these anions are shown here, and these would be recognizable as the conjugate bases of weak acids. So for example, fluoride anion is a conjugate base of HF, which is a weak acid. These solutions are basic because they form hydroxide, and the pH of these solutions will be greater than 7. The second category are cations, BH+, that represent the conjugate acids of weak bases. Like any weak acids, these can dissociate in water to form hydronium ion and release the neutral base. So these should be recognizable as the protonated form of weak bases that we've learned, such as ammonia or these amines, and these are now the conjugate acids. These solutions become acidic because they form the hydronium ion, and the pH of their solutions will be less than 7. The third category is the most complex. These are called the amphiprotic anions that are associated with the polyprotic acid. Now, amphi in Latin means both. And what's complex about these anions is that they have acidic and basic groups. So they could do either an acid dissociation or a base dissociation. And it's ambiguous which one that they would do at the outset. So here are some examples of anions that are related to a polyprotic acid. And I'm going to focus on the example of hydrogen sulfite, which is this anion shown here. So we have an acidic proton that can be lost, but we also have this O minus group that can pick up a proton. Now, whether this anion dissolved in water will release hydronium ion or hydroxide will depend which K is more favored. So let's start with what this anion can do. So as an acid, it can undergo a Ka reaction to release hydronium ion and its conjugate base, SO3 2 minus. But if we treat this anion as a base, it can undergo a Kb reaction to form hydroxide and then its conjugate acid, the neutral H2SO3. So which of these is favored depends on which of these Ks has a greater value, and we can actually solve for that. For polyprotic acids, we're given the different Ka values. So for dihydrogen sulfite, we have Ka1 and Ka2. Now for these two reactions, we can use this information that's given to figure out what these exact K values are. The first equation is the most straightforward because this is a reaction where HSO3- minus is acting as an acid, and this is related then to Ka2. The second reaction, HSO3, is acting as a base and its conjugate acid is H2SO3. So if we wanted to solve for Kb, we would use that relationship that Ka times Kb equals Kw. But here we would say that Kb1 is equal to Kw over Ka1 because the acid is H2SO3 and this acid is associated with Ka1. So by plugging in those values, 1 times 10 to the minus 14 for Kw, and then the Ka1 value, we can obtain the Kb 
of this reaction as 7.1 times 10 to the minus 13. Now we can compare these values between these two reactions, and you'll notice that Ka2 is much larger than the Kb. And so therefore, the Ka reaction will win over and we will form hydronium ions. And the solution, if we dissolve this salt in water, will be acidic or the pH will be less than seven. Before I talked about ions just on their own, but in reality, salts are made of, of both a cation and an anion. So what would happen if both parts of the salt have reactive ions and can change the pH, but in opposite ways? So one example of such a salt would be this methyl ammonium hypochlorite salt. And in the cation portion, this is a protonated amine, so this is a conjugate acid. And in the anion portion, hypochlorite is the conjugate base of HOCl, which is a weak acid. In order to decide whether the solution would become acidic or basic, we basically have to compare whether the Ka for the cation is better or worse than the Kb for the anion. So we can write out these two reactions where methyl ammonium, the cation, undergoes a Ka reaction to form hydronium ion and the weak base. And we can write a second reaction where the anion hypochlorite dissociates some water in a Kb reaction to form hydroxide and the conjugate acid HOCl. The values that we are given are the Kb for the base and the Ka for the weak acid. And so for this base, we're actually not interested in Kb, but the Ka of its conjugate acid. And so we can solve for Ka of methyl ammonium by dividing the Kb value of the amine into Kw. We get the value of Ka as 2.3 times 10 to the minus 11. In the second reaction, we're given the Ka for HOCl, but we're interested in the Kb for its conjugate base. So again, we can use the same equality, but now we're solving for Kb by dividing the Ka into Kw, and by plugging these values in, we obtain that the Kb is 3.4 times 10 to the minus 7. So now we can compare the values for these two potential equilibrium constants, and we see that the Kb value wins because it's greater. And so when dissolving this salt in solution, the dominant equilibrium will be the Kb1. It will form hydroxide, and the solution of the water will be basic, or the pH will be greater than 7. In the last part of this video, I want to talk about the special role that solvents play in acid-base chemistry. All solvents exert something called a leveling effect. And that means, depending on what the solvent is, the strongest acid and the strongest base that can exist is related to that solvent. So in water, the strongest acid that can exist is the hydronium ion. And in water, the strongest base that can exist is hydroxide. And so when we had this chart that ranked our acids and their conjugate bases by strength, uh, we can see that hydronium ion is here at the bottom of the strong acids, and hydroxide ion is located here among the strong bases. But actually, in reality, these strong acids have different strengths. So HCl is stronger than sulfuric acid, which is stronger than nitric acid, which is stronger than hydronium ions. But upon dissolving all of these in water, they are equally strong because they all dissociate to form hydronium ion. So in water, basically, you cannot distinguish 
between these strong acids and they're all equally strong. So let's think about an unusual solvent like ammonia. Um, there are some reactions that require this as a solvent. And in ammonia then, the strongest acid that can exist is protonated ammonia or ammonium cation. And the strongest base that can exist is deprotonated ammonia or NH2 minus. And so NH2 minus can't exist in water, so it's not on the chart, but here's NH4 plus. And so if ammonia was a solvent and not water, then every acid from HCl all the way down to HCN are equally strong because they would all dissociate to form NH4 plus in ammonia solvent. And so now we have strong acids and acids that we considered relatively weak, but in NH3, they are all equally strong because they all form NH4 plus completely. Because of this, you can see that by changing the solvent, we really change our definition of what is considered strong versus weak. Some reactions take place in acetic acid and the strongest acid that can exist would be protonated acetic acid and the strongest base that can exist would be the deprotonated acetic acid. So protonated acetic acid is quite strong. The conjugate base of acetic acid is right here in the middle. So in this solvent, then acetate and everything stronger is considered an equally strong base. And that's because if you were to start with any of these bases below acetate, they would react completely away to just form acetate. And so in acetic acid, even um, relatively weak bases, such as HS minus, is as equally strong as S2 minus or O2 minus. So to recap, what we learned early on was the definition of a strong acid and a strong base versus a weak acid and a weak base. And all those definitions were strongly tied to the fact that water is the solvent. And that's okay because water is quite a universal solvent, both in chemistry and in life.